Good evening, everyone. Welcome to week nine of administrative law. We're really motoring through this term. Um, big week this week, lots of lots of great things to cover. But first off, a bit of a housekeeping, uh, just a quick reminder that the uh, group discussion task is due on Friday. So if you haven't made your posts in Moodle, please do that as soon as you can. Um, there's because there's the group discussion dynamic and, and people have to reply to each other's posts. Um, this assessment really works if you do get in there early. If you leave it to the last minute, you sort of you run the risk of not having anything to reply to and and not giving anyone else some material to respond to as well. So please do make sure that you get in there early. Before I started recording, we just had a couple of questions that I'll repeat for the benefit of those listening in. Um, the first is the reply. Do you post that to the Moodle forum as well, or do you just put it straight in the Word document? And the answer is no, you, you post that in the, um, in the discussion forum as well. And then the second question is, can you reply to your partner from the assessment or do you have to respond to someone from another group? Uh, and the answer is you're more than welcome to reply to your partner's post. It's not, um, uh, it's not an easy out. It's not viewed less favorably. It's not marked more harshly. You're more than welcome to, to do that. So any other questions about that group discussion for task before we move on? Excellent. So yeah, um, so, sorry, go ahead, Nathaniel. Um, so it's probably a bit of a silly one, but I did notice that the whole idea of the task was to sort of get a bit of a dialogue going. Um, and I noticed that you only really want like one comment. Um, say that you are able to get like a bit of a rally going or maybe like start to discuss a few ideas. Would it be okay or would it be preferable to maybe put like one or two in there or would you still just prefer the one? Um, it's a good question. I'm not... Here's, here's what I'd say, post, um, post the whole thing or like, you know, copy the whole thing across, but make clear to me what you think the best part is. And so I can mark that, but I will see the full context and, and realize that, you know, there's, there's sort of more to the story. Um, and, you know, more generally, you make a good point about, you know, it's set up as uh, meant to be a, a really engaging back and forward. And yet it's, all it requires is just a, that, that kind of thing. Um, really, this task is to get, to be accredited, you have to do a group discussion assessment. Um, and so basically the way that we can do that is we can mark tutorial participation, um, which is always hard for people who can't attend, um, or we can do something like this on, on a forum. So that's that's sort of the the way or the reason why the task is set up the way that it is. Um, and yeah, you know, if there's, if there is a, a more lively dialogue, then that's fantastic. And if you guys get something out of that, then that's really awesome. Um, but from a, a, a pragmatic perspective, you know, the, the requirements are set lower than that, but yeah, if there's, there's more to it. That's fantastic. Any other questions? Excellent. All right. Well, let's jump straight into natural justice and procedural fairness. Um, two really great grounds of review. They're, they tend to be ones that um, are fairly intuitive in that, you know, because as, as uh, you know, wannabe lawyers, we've got this innate or I guess all humans really have it I suppose this innate sense of when something is not fair or when something just doesn't feel right and that's what these grounds of review tap into so it the, this ground of review tends to be one that when you're reading through a scenario it tends to be easy to identify that something doesn't feel off or doesn't feel right um, when you compare it to you know something like relevant or irrelevant considerations or statutory purpose where it's a bit more technical. Um, it requires that sort of statutory interpretation angle, which is a bit more abstract. It the, the issues are maybe a little bit more tricky to identify, whereas procedural fairness, I find people kind of get the idea of it more quickly um, and, and pick it up in a scenario more readily. But 
just because on the surface level, it's easy to get, don't let that trick you into thinking, oh, well, this is really straightforward. I'll, I'll get it. There's, there's sort of the, the complexity and the nuance beneath the sur surface that you really need to make sure that you're across and comfortable with for um, an exam perspective. And so what I really mean by that is so thinking about, um, you know, when does procedural fairness apply? Um, thinking through these steps, and we'll talk about it in relation to the scenarios in a minute, but thinking through the steps around, look, just because um, the Administrative Decisions Judicial Review Act says that there's a ground of review for procedural fairness and, and natural justice, um, we need to read that in the context of Justice Mason's comments in Kiara and West, saying that Section 5.1a doesn't just give you this ground of review. It has to still come from somewhere else. This, this expectation that you will be afforded natural justice, you have to be able to point to somewhere else that that comes from. Um, and then, you know, very helpfully, Justice Brennan said, there's a common law presumption that you will get it. So you tend to have it, but you need to be thinking that there's more steps than just, oh, Section 5.1a natural justice, right? You need to be able to talk through Justice Mason's comments, Justice Brennan's comments, and as a package say, because of that, there's an expectation that natural justice will be afforded. So that's that's something that just sort of gives you an idea that just because something on the surface looks unfair, there's got to be more to it. And there's got to be more to your answer than just, oh, well, you know, the the hypothetical client um, didn't get to have their say, so that that really sucked for them. There's got to be that sort of deeper discussion and and more detail. And then, of course, you know, layering on top of that, you know, when it applies matters, but what natural justice demands matters even more. And that's that's something that often gets overlooked and often gets um, doesn't get as much discussion as it deserves. Um, and the reason for that is that it deserves a detailed discussion because it's tricky, right? On the one hand, we've got Justice Mason's comments that what natural justice demands is con in contextual, depends on the facts of the case, right? We've got these... Um, we've got the rule, the, the hearing rule and the rule against bias, and those are good starting points, but they're just starting points, right? You need to be able to talk through, you know, what's actually going on here in, in this scenario and how does that relate to these hearing rules and, and rules against bias? On the other hand, you've got the fact that the court wasn't, doesn't want to go too far into the executive realm and dictate exactly what the decision maker should or shouldn't have done, right? So there's this whole package of complexity and detail that you need to be able to engage with in an answer to show that you really understand um, natural justice and procedural fairness. Kelly, you've got a question. Yeah, sorry. And this might be a really odd question or silly question, but natural justice is the way it's referred to in legislation and procedural fairness is the way it's referred to in common law. So is that the only difference? What's the difference between the two? Fundamentally, that's, there's, they're, tr they're treated the same, right? There's, um, and, and the reason for it is that there's an expectation because administrative law and judicial review is so focused on process, yeah. um, the, 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 natural justice that arises um, to an applicant or should have been afforded to an applicant is that they should have been dealt with in a procedurally fair way. But yeah, so you can... I, just sure I wasn't missing some little connector there that, you know, so I just wanted to make sure I was understanding it correctly. Yeah, no, that's that's all good. Um, and you know, it's 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 preferable in, in an exam answer drawing on the ADJR it's preferable to refer to it as natural justice rather than procedural fairness. Um, 
but given that the common law presumptions are so integral to the um, natural justice arising, you know, if you use both terms, it's not, I'm not going to have a heart attack about it. You know, it's, it's, yeah, it's fine. <laughs> um, so, yeah, so, so dealing with what does, uh, what are the, what does the context demand um, in terms of natural justice? Being able to navigate that complexity. It's not just, oh, well, they didn't get a hearing, therefore um, they have been denied procedural fairness. That's a, a good starting point, but you need to be able to talk through, you know, what, what's going on here? What's, what's the context? What are all the factors? Um, and so a good example of this, I think I, I talked maybe a few weeks ago about a previous exam that was set um, on this guy was on a boat and the government thought that he had COVID and so he was sent to hotel quarantine. Um, and so the facts pointed you to natural justice um, because he was sent to hotel quarantine and he hadn't been given a chance to comment on the COVID test and all that sort of stuff. But really, really good answers engaged with this idea of what, what does the context demand? And the context is we're in the middle of, uh, at the time, in the middle of a COVID paranoia lockdown craziness. You can understand why in that context, they didn't have time to stand around and have a chat about oh, look, were you feeling seasick or were you this or were you that? It was just, okay, you might you might be sick and you might make everyone around you sick. We just need to get you away kind of thing. So being able to take the, the scenario as a whole and talk that through and talk about how that relates to natural justice and, and what the, the scenario demands, that's, you know, that's really important to demonstrate that high level critical analysis and, and that ability to understand really what's going on in this judicial review space. So, you know, the courts, the court's role is not to say, look, here's the procedure that should have been followed. The fact that it wasn't means that there's a problem. They're not that prescriptive. Instead, we're more looking at these general principles and look at sort of the implications of that. Um, so making sure that you've got the ability to discuss some of that detail and nuance is really important. Any questions on, I suppose, natural justice and procedural fairness in broad terms before we move on to those hypothetical questions? Well, it's, it's mostly about the case law, this one, isn't it? It's, there's a, a heavier reliance on the case law, yeah, because, mm. because there's, for one, because we're guided by Kiora and West and, and Justice Mason saying, look, um, you don't just automatically get natural justice just because it's in the legislation doesn't mean you automatically get it. There's got to be, um, there's got to be something else that you can pin it on. And then Justice Brennan saying, well, the starting point is common law presumption that you get it, and then legislation may modify that or, or um, you know, set limits on on the process that's to be followed or whatever. Um, so yeah, there is there is that sort of immediately sets up a a greater reliance on the case law where compared to some of the other weeks where. The ground yeah, like the, the assignment, which, the assessment, which was a lot on legislation, wasn't it? Yes. Yeah, yeah. absolutely. And and even some of the grounds of review that we've talked about in the last couple of weeks, they're more, I suppose, inherently available. And the case law just sort of helps you, helps clarify the position or helps illustrate what's going on. Whereas, uh, yeah, natural justice, because there is this sort of... Um, appeal to broader principle as well that that isn't necessarily as as evident in some of the other grounds of review we do have kind of a more expanded case law that we can rely on any other questions 
Awesome. Well, let's let's sort of see how that plays out in action with a couple of hypothetical scenarios. So our first one for uh, for this week is actually we're revisiting the scenario from week seven, which was the uh, the gaming and casino where the um, the undercover officers took alcohol into the venue and then demanded that. Um, that the employees get fired. So in week seven, we talked about the decision makers authority to, um, to raise or to require the, the termination of their employment. And we, you know, took some issue with that. Now what we're thinking about, okay, are there additional avenues that we can pursue looking at procedural fairness or, or natural justice? So I suppose given given that we already talked about the availability of judicial review in week seven in relation to this scenario, we'll, we'll skip that discussion where we're satisfied that judicial review would be available. Um, and let's dive in to these natural justice ideas and, and initially have a brainstorm about what seems relevant or potentially relevant. Jago? Yes. Um, my f first point that I made <clears throat> was that the officer's decision failed to afford procedural fairness pursuant to section five, subsection one um, of the ADJR Act. Case authority on that one is Kia, of course, in relation to administrative decisions where it may be accepted that a common law duty to act fairly subject only to the manifestation of contrary statutory intention. Um, the decision made by the authority was a decision of an administrative character, of course, uh, pursuant to section three, subsection one um, of the ADJR. Um, it was the executive, it was an executive decision. The decision was affected, affected the rights and interests of the person being investigated, Poe. The decision was final. The question of standing in relation to Poe was uncontroversial. Um, the next question I asked was, were the rules of natural justice applied when making an administrative decision pursuant to section 5.1a? The officer from the Gaming Casino Licensing Authority was required to follow a set of procedures pursuant to the Gaming Casino Licensing Act, section 26, subsection three, that the authority must provide at least 28 days notice that the inquiry will take place. This was not followed by the officer. So, that would be, in my estimations, the first avenue, first ground of reviewing through the court, through the federal circuit court. What are your thoughts on that? Okay, so thinking about um, thinking about the issues around the notice that's required to be provided under Section Twenty Six, and then. Um, on the basis of that saying that there's a problem with the process. Am I understanding that right? Yeah. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. I, um, I don't mind it. The, and we'll, we'll circle back and talk about structuring the answer and, and, you know, bringing in Justice Mason and that sort of stuff. Um, but to to deal with the substance of it at the moment, the I think the challenge that I have with that approach is that it focuses on the the steps leading up to the inquiry rather than the steps that attach to the decision itself. Um, there's certainly a fair argument that, look, they were meant to be, they were meant to be given notice and on the facts, it seems like maybe they weren't. Um, and, and, you know, in week seven, we talked about 
that potentially rendering the decision um, invalid because it wasn't authorized because it didn't follow those particular um, processes or procedures. When we think about natural justice, and I'll, I'll invite um, more answers on this in a moment, so I don't want to um, I don't want to preempt that discussion. But when we think about natural justice and in particular thinking about the hearing rule, we tend to more focus on the processes that that happen closer to when the decision was made. So um, the notice that the decision had been made, those sorts of the timing around that rather than the notice that the officers might be coming down the track and that sort of thing. But I can, I can see where you're going with it. Um, I think it would, it's, it's really more falls into the camp of the unauthorized decision-making end of things rather than the natural justice end of things, but you know, still uh, either way, that? either way it gets you to an invalid decision, which is the ultimate goal, I suppose. Uh, I heard someone else starting to oh, talk as well. Oh, this is Carlo. I was just going to say, um, the two workers, um, you know, there's some implied duty to have natural dust, uh, natural justice in the decision, and to hear the other side. Well, you know, some of those comments might have been not listened to, and I yeah. think, um, and you know, that the decision was made without them. Um, having a, a, a place to, you know, explain why the people were in there drinking. Right. And so when we think about the hearing and, rule, sorry. And, I've and I was just going to, um, I just like Bill, he, he um, mentions a lot of case law, but I was going to say, you know, Cooper and the Board of Works where the, you know, the house got demolished without, you know, letting him know what was going on. Yep. Yeah, absolutely. And, and thinking about the hearing rule um, and really focusing in on the substance around being informed that this decision is going to be made, this is the basis on which the decision is going to be made, here's your opportunity to provide more information or to correct where there's an issue, those sorts of things. Um, and on the facts that sort of hasn't occurred at all, right? It just, it, the decision comes out of nowhere that this has happened. Um, these two employees, we saw them allowing alcohol, so they have to be gone and there's no opportunity for um, Ho or the employees themselves to respond to that, to explain, you know, whatever it was, you know, oh, it looked like an alcoholic beverage, but actually we only serve non-alcoholic beer in here. Whatever it is, um, there's been no, no allowance for that and no opportunity to make comment. Um, any other thoughts? Um, I'm just going... Oh, you go, Luke. Oh, thank you, Talitha. Uh, just back to what Bill was saying about the prior notice for the inspection. Mm -hmm the 28 days rule, um, Ridge versus Baldwin might be a useful case there where uh, he was kicked out of the police force without prior notice. Yep. Yep. And, and so we're, we're honing in on the notice thing, which I like, um, and we'll have a chat through the details of that in a moment. And, Cause I've seen Abby's comment in the chat as well about um, section 26 and, and whether that gives rise to natural justice or whether it precludes it. And I want to talk through in that in more detail too, but I want to save that discussion for a moment, but the notice thing attaches to that too. So that's a good point. Uh, Talitha. Um, I probably just took a step further back in terms of working out whether natural justice should apply before, like, rather than, um, straight away going in um, and I just stepped through the questions that were in Work Cover Corporation of South Australia and Davey. Um, there were sort of like seven questions there um, to help you 
work out whether you think natural justice should apply. Um, and like, I, I won't go through all of them now unless, unless I'm sure you will in, in your wrap up. But um, with that, I sort of just said that based on the facts um, and that the Act contains, and particularly because the Act, um, the Act in here, the Gambling um, Act, uh, contains a procedure that should be followed to carry out disciplinary action that it suggests that natural justice should apply. So um, that's how I started tackling it. Yep, yep. Um, yeah, I like it. And, and this sort of ties into the point that I wanted to make in relation to um, Abby's comments in the chat. So for the people who are listening to this recording later and don't have the benefit of the chat, I'll just quickly read out the comments. So Abby said that the act is silent in terms of section 26, um, procedural fairness or natural justice isn't explicitly mentioned and the, therefore we need to rely on the common law. So coming back to, um, you know, Justice Mason's comments in Care and West that um, the ADJR Act doesn't inherently give you natural justice, therefore we need to look somewhere else. The best place to look is the primary legislation to see if that gives you natural justice. Um, in this instance, it doesn't appear to. And so then the next step being, um, do we look to common law? Uh, and then the comment goes on. Additionally, the Act doesn't express um, content to exclude procedural fairness. Um, and so thinking about, you know, is there anything in Section 26 that would say that um, that natural justice shouldn't apply or, or that provides some limit or constraint on the way that natural justice would be afforded. And I think those comments tie nicely into um, Talitha's use of work, the work cover case. Um, and in particular, thinking about, you know, where there's, where there are processes that are identified that would, would sort of push us in the direction of, natural justice or, or procedural fairness being um, uh, being something that we would expect to occur. Where, where I think there's, I suppose, an element of trickiness is arriving is coming into this question of, are we talking about does procedural fairness or, or is natural justice required versus if it is required, what is the content of that natural justice or, or what should natural justice look like in this case or in this scenario? And that's where this, did they get the 28 day notice? Um, that gets, that's where things get a little bit tricky, right? And I'm just going to dive into to the things that I was going to say. I'm sorry if, if other people wanted to, to add more. When we think about the hearing rule and when we think about ultimately what the hearing rule is getting at is did the person affected by the decision have the opportunity to comment on the information or the substance on which the decision was going to be made before they made it? Um, that's, you know, if we, if we had to sum up the hearing rule in one sentence, that's what it would be. The reason that the 28 day notice under section 26 is tricky is because yes on the facts it seems like they didn't um they weren't given that notice if if they weren't given that notice but the decision maker still went ahead with the inquiry and then before they made the decision reached out to poe and said look we went in we had this inquiry here's what we saw here's what we found um, please, you know, do we have anything wrong? Are we mistaken on this? You know, this is your opportunity to supply us with more evidence, whatever you want to do to respond before we make the decision. There'd be a pretty strong argument that natural justice has been provided. Yes, they didn't follow the procedure. And yes, from an, the unauthorized decision-making perspective, that's a problem. But from a natural justice perspective, they've still been afforded natural justice because they've still had the opportunity to um, 
make comment on the information on which the decision was going to be made before they made it. Um, and so that's where the section 20, um, the section 26 notice that there was going to be something happening is different from the notice that's referred to in the hearing rule in terms of um, notice that a decision is going to be made and be being given the opportunity to comment on that before it is actually made. Does that, does that distinction make sense? Yes. Excellent. So, you know, you guys, you guys are very right to be, uh, you know, to have the alarm bells going off in relation to, well, the act says you get 28 days notice and he wasn't given that. Yes, that's a problem. Um, Certainly, from an un un unauthorized decision-making perspective, that should be, um, you know, there's a target on that. Um, from the perspective of, is it does natural justice arise? Arguably, yes. That um, that notice requirement leans more heavily in favour of yes, natural justice um, is is expected. But in terms of thinking about okay, well, what's the content of the natural justice or the process? It's of less, it's of less value. Um, and, and what's more important is the stuff that actually attaches to the decision and, and how or whether the applicant or the affected person was given opportunity to comment on the decision before it was made. I think as well because um, of the way that you explained that um, section 26 procedure like even if they got that notice there would, there's no opportunity for them to comment because the officers don't need to like reveal who they are when they come to do that so I feel as though like the intention of section 26 was like not to even afford them any ability to comment even if they did get that 28 days so I think like even though they didn't get it like even if they did they still wouldn't have got natural justice because these people kind of came undercover did their thing and then went away and just issued like uh issued the notice so even if they knew they were coming they didn't know who they were to be able to say oh xyz this is what happened yeah, absolutely. Um, so yeah, you're coming at it, I suppose, from the other perspective, right? So I, I sort of said, um, if, if they didn't give the notice, but they still gave an opportunity to comment, um, then that would be natural justice. Whereas you're saying, um, look, if they, if they gave them the notice that they were coming, but then still didn't have a chat to them before they made the decision, then that still wouldn't be natural justice. And yeah, you're right. It's it, um, you know, it's it's coming at it from both angles, um, to to show that the natural justice attaches to the the decision and and the the facts surrounding the decision rather than these procedural steps that came earlier in the time series, right? Because that's the the issuing. Look, we're going to inspect you sometime in the next month. Isn't really the decision. Um, the decision is the you need to fire these two employees. So from an exam perspective, Jacob, if you throw something like this at us, because you did say it'll be one scenario with a whole heap of questions that'll be raised out of it, that you would still want us to identify potentially that it being an issue for the notice period, but then going further of that if the scenario doesn't state that they hadn't been given any further opportunity, that it would be right to then go into the natural justice scenario. Yeah, and so um, this is a good, good illustration, I suppose, of um, I think we've talked about in previous weeks, the, the exam scenario, you'll get one scenario and from that there will be multiple grounds of review to talk about, right? And so if this, if this was an exam scenario, you you'd have the the 26 the section 26 issue is really big from that unauthorized decision making perspective um and so that would sort of trigger uh, a discussion that we had in week 7 and then on top of that you'd say look it's not great that they didn't do that and then even further 
beyond that, once they actually went in and made the decision, they didn't give the client natural justice as well for the reasons that we've discussed too. And so you, you, the scenario is giving you um, fertile ground to talk about more than one ground of review, even if the particular elements don't attach to, um, uh, you know, you're not using the same facts for each ground of review necessarily. That's what I just wanted to clarify from my get from me, I guess, is that that's sort of what the conversation we've had in the past has been, and then that's this is sort of a similar situation or an example of how it could look come the exam period. Right. And so, um, and I think previously we've talked as well about structuring your exam and we've talked about, look, some people find it easier to talk through the different grounds of review and um, talk about, you know, the issues that arise in relation to each. Some people prefer to, you know, pull out a bunch of problems or sections within the act and then talk about the grounds of review that arise for each of them. So this is a good example of that, right? If it, if it makes more sense to you to say, look, here's the unauthorized decision-making issues, bam, bam, bam. Here's the natural justice issues, da, da, da. Go ahead. If it makes more sense to you to go, okay, section 26 says this, um, that's an, that's a problem because they didn't give the notice, so it's an unauthorized decision making. It's also a problem because it clues us on to natural justice, and even if the the failure to give notice itself wasn't a breach of natural justice, it still leads us down that pathway. So, just yeah, whichever way makes more sense in your mind to think about the issues, um, do that in the exam because it it will come across more clearly in your writing and therefore it will make more sense to me as well. Um, any other questions on that one? So for, from the perspective of, you know, what, what would this look like as an answer? Um, having dealt with availability, you then, the starting point needs to be that discussion that we had um, at the beginning of this tutorial around um, Section 51A, Justice Mason's comments in Kiara and West, supplemented by um, Justice Brennan and, and the common law presumption. And then as Talitha has said, you know, uh, the work cover case really helps um, support this argument that there's an expectation that natural justice will be given in this scenario. Then having established, yes, we would expect to get natural justice. What should that look like? Uh, and again, and, and, you know, last week we talked about your exam scripts. So much of that you can have pre-written, right? A lot of that is, is applies to any natural justice question, no matter what the scenario is. Um, and then following that with, with Justice Mason's comments that, you know, whether it applies or not, is less important than actually what does natural justice demand. And then you have the discussion around the hearing rule and what would natural justice look like in this scenario and appreciating the nuance that the court isn't looking to um, prescribe an exact procedure, but you'd suggest that here there would be natural justice would look like Poe being given an opportunity to comment on the proposed decision, the, the substance of that information, uh, of the information on which it's going to be made, and to correct the record if, if needs to be done. So, and, and, and just making clear, you know, in saying that, you're not dictating how the inquiry should have been conducted. You're not saying, you know, oh, they should have been given two weeks to give a, a comment, you know, not prescribing timeframes. You're not saying, you're not even necessarily um, challenging the outcome of the decision itself in the sense that, um, you know, you're not saying they didn't have alcohol. Um, it's more focused on, they weren't given the chance to, um, to comment on the information and, and provide more relevant information if it, if it was available or, or needed to be given. So, you know, like the example of, oh, it was 
they only served non-alcoholic drinks. And even though it looks like beer, it, it actually kind of wasn't or whatever it is. So giving, giving detail in your discussion, but expressly acknowledging that you're not dictating exactly what the process should have looked like because the court is not, that's not what they want to be involved in. Um, cool. So that's any final questions from that one. Let's move on to question two. Um, so this scenario, we've got a TV interview with James Colt uh, interviewing the Minister for Immigration um, who says on the program, as the minister, I have very strong reservations about people applying for Australian resident visas who claim to have an epiphany and claim to be good and honourable men despite having committed serious crimes in the past. Uh, they're heavily radicalised and they're a potential danger to our community, even if they appear respectable today by running a string of businesses in Sydney or elsewhere. Um, about a month after the interview, our potential client, Omar Ward, who owns a profitable chain of laundromats, gets a letter saying that his application for a visa has been denied on account of his past. Um, and that the letter stated that notwithstanding the character references and, edit, and evidence presented that he was a changed man, the minister was of the view that he would should be excluded. So Omar has come to us to say, you know, I think that the minister was biased against him uh, based on the TV interview. And it's up to us to sort of give some detail about uh, the potential arguments. So again, just initially brainstorming what do we think might be um, an issue here? Jacob is having, uh, again, the question of national justice and fairness will apply. I assume that the common law will apply, you know, uh, in this scenario. And the main argument for me was more around the bias and the, 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 the concerns that the minister has some kind of bias already, especially in particular concern about the bias by conduct uh, due to his statements made on the TV. Uh, and then I looked at the bias test, the general rule of the principle that a fair-minded person may suspect and the decision maker might not resolve the direction with a fair, fair fairness in mind. And uh, the case authority I used for that was the law versus Australian Broadcasting Authority. And then I looked at, uh, uh, to, 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 to a person from the community or a lay person, it might seem to him uh, due to the decision maker comments that the conclusion was already fixed. Uh, but I didn't say that, uh, it's really hard, I mean, uh, to say that uh, he was biased, but I'm going, uh, I'm going on the likes of apprehended bias. Uh, so it was more around uh, statements for, showed that fair-minded person, you know, I mean, they were perceived that there was biasness and apprehension and uh, yeah, around that and, and that the decision maker would not uh, we don't think the minister would have been persuaded by any argument because he had this apprehended bias in his mind already. Yep, absolutely. So really focusing in on these ideas from laws and ABT around, um, you know, what what would a fair-minded person think of the way that the decision maker has gone about this, and and do they think that? Um, you know, would they think that the person, the decision maker might not resolve the issue with a, a fair and unprejudiced prejudiced mind? So yeah, really good to be focusing on that as the standard. Uh, anyone else? Yeah, I tend to agree with Abby. Um, and I use the case authority also of Minister of Immigration, Multicultural Affairs and GIA. Yep. Um, and of course, that quote of uh, the question is not whether the decision maker's mind is blank, it is, it is whether it is open to persuasion. The information about the accused jihadi fighters was in the public domain by reason of the comments of the Minister of Immigration on national television. The state of mind described as bias in the form of prejudgment is one so committed to a conclusion already formed as to be incapable of alteration. Um, 
The decision of the minister gives rise to apprehended bias because of the comments made against the group referred to as the jihadi fighters, which prejudice their characters um, in the eyes of the department. So I've just added that little bit to it as well. So I agree with Abby's conclusion on that. Yep. Yeah, absolutely. Um, and wouldn't the minister just need to prove that he was a jihadi fighter and there wouldn't be any bias? The I want to make a note and then I would like to hear more about that argument. So um Tell me more. Sorry, Luke, did you want to? Um, I'd, that, that's all, Jacob. I just had that thought that so... um, if there was evidence of jihadi behavior, that would completely counter the argument of bias, wouldn't it? So it's an interesting one, right? And, and, Part of it, part of what makes the scenario trickier is that we're not going into a deep dive of, of the Migration Act and, and focusing in on what the minister can and can't take into account and that sort of stuff. But the, what's, what's not an issue is, is whether he was, um, was a jihadi fighter in the past or not what's what's more in play in this particular scenario is whether um mr ward now meets whatever character requirements are set out in the migration act and so it's not and and the reason for that is the the minister's not saying um look if you've ever if you've ever um been a jihadi fighter then you we're not having you it's um the the comment around um they they claim to have an opinion epiphany and claim to be good and honorable men um and then further down, you know, they're heavily radicalized, even if they may appear respectable today by running a string of businesses in Sydney or elsewhere. Right. So the, the comments about good and honorable men is quite easy to, to play with, isn't it? Because he hasn't really defined what an honorable man is. That seems pretty clear. Well, there's, there's, I suppose, um, doesn't running a business in Sydney, even though that you do that, that still doesn't make you honourable. So running a business doesn't make you honourable. So just the general <laughs> terms of things does not make you honourable. Um, uh, look, we love a, a bit of healthy scepticism of small businesses in Sydney. Um, the there's there's two elements to this, right? And I think I think where this discussion is going is, um, is he actually good or honourable? Um, is he, uh, and by he, I mean, um, Mr. Ward, is he um, this reformed character who's um, you know, good and an and upstanding member of the community or not? Um, on the question of bias and and the rule against bias from a natural justice perspective that stuff is almost irrelevant because as as bill pointed out right the the standard here that we're really looking at is whether the decision maker was open to persuasion or not right it's if if the minister had looked at his file in its totality and looked at the character references, looked at the past, looked at his business dealings, whatever was in front of him and said, mm, 
look, I think you're probably on your way to becoming a better person, but I just still think that there's these echoes of radicalization that are, um, you know, that you still pose a, a threat. Therefore, we're not having your visa. That at least shows an openness to being persuaded, right? There's, there's, a, there's the chance that had the evidence been good enough, had the character references been good enough, the minister would have said, yes, actually, I think that you are okay. Yes, you've done horrible things, but I think that you've put that behind you and, and now you're, you're a changed person and, and we're happy to have you. you. You would believe that there was at least the possibility of the minister arriving at that decision. What the, the particular issue here is the comments around, look, they claim to have this epiphany, but I don't believe them for a second. Um, and, and the focus that's eerily close to um, Mr. Ward's position around, even if they appear respectable by running a, a string of businesses. Um, and then in the decision letter, um, saying that notwithstanding the character references and evidence presented that he was changed, um, the minister was of the view that he's an excluded person. Those, those factors combined point to, it, it's not so much, oh, is he actually changed or not? It more points to the minister's mind was made up before um, he even considered the file, right? He wasn't open to persuasion or a fair-minded person wouldn't think that he was open to persuasion. And, and that's really an issue. I, I can see where you guys are, are coming from in that, um, it was probably perfectly open to the minister to say, look, congratulations, you can run a laundry that doesn't wash away all the terrible things that you've done in the past. So that was a bad and very accidental um, washing pun there. Um, but <laughs> I get one dad joke a term and I've wasted it by accident. Um, what we're interested in for the rule on bias is would a fair-minded person believe that the minister was making this with an unpre decision with an unprejudiced prejudiced mind? Would they believe that they were open to persuasion? And the difficulty is that the comments that were made on TV make that a, a difficult thing to, to believe. You've got your hand up, Talitha. Um. I guess maybe I'm just a bit more up for a fight like Luke. Um, so how does then the comments also in Minister for Immigration and Jahar about ministers cannot be expected to have the same level of impartiality as judges? See, like if I wanted to argue the fact that Luke started, I like you could argue the fact that even just with the word notwithstanding the character references to me gives the indication that he's considered those. He's taken though, like it's not as though he's not even referred to them. He's saying, notwithstanding the character references, included. So, in my view, you can make the argument to say, well, he's acknowledged that those have come in and he's determined that I still don't, you know, um, meet the qualifications. And the fact that, you know, in that Minister for Immigration and Multicultural Affairs, they make the point to say that ministers can be drawn into a debate in respect of matters that they're in respect of matters that they are exercising power. So I suppose he could argue that I'm debating, you know, this issue that I have the power over. And then I have consequently gone and considered, and I don't believe that you are like, you know, factoring in. Like, yeah. I don't know. I just thought, you know, if you wanted to kind of come at it from a different angle, that's how I came at it was that, you know, I, I think he could probably weasel out of it if he really wanted to. <laughs> yeah. Well, and that's, that's fair enough. Sorry, you go ahead, Abby. You know, in response to that question, what I was thinking was if he didn't make the TV interview, you could argue on that. Uh, if there was no TV interview. But I think I, I the point of the I think the point of the case is saying yeah. that they can do interviews and they can talk about these things because this the power true. of 
the legislation gives them power to make decisions, but equally to be like, otherwise, if they can't debate or talk about anything, how is that a democracy? How, how then do we constitutionally elect people to carry out this? Like if we don't know where they stand on anything. On the other hand, we don't want their personal bias to be affecting people's uh, judgment as well. Uh, I mean, seriously, yeah, I've seen some cases like this in reality. Because I come from India, I've seen some people make some comments and, and impact real life justice. And it's impact dramatic. And I know where and you're I coming from. When you're arguing with somebody's life and a family and there are three kids and they need to go back, I think where you look at everything. Right? And then the idea is just to find whatever you can find. And, and there's clear bias. And but, and the, and stay said they can't be persuasive. I mean, you made your mind up. I do not like Abby, no matter what happens. And I'm giving you whatever I can to say you should like Abby. You already made your mind up. Now you whatever you come with, a lay person would think that you are not going to like Abby. It doesn't matter what he says, what he hears, what what marks he gets. And and that's I think society and community plays a big role in these things. That's where the, the lay person not uh, being persuasive that he we would have been persuaded is is the key argument here. Isn't um, Talitha's argument? perfectly placed for the next question. I think it answers the next question. <laughs> yes, perfectly. yes, yeah, I would agree that. I've got evidence to prove class, but I'm happy to stay with them and enjoy this. Section 501 and 502. Um, Ange, you wanted to make a comment as well. Yeah, I'm going to have to go to the next lecture, but um, I'm going to have to watch the end of this recording now. Okay. Um, <laughs> Um, I just think that the word notwithstanding can be very loose and I think you could argue either which way as long as you've got the evidence and the, um, you're going you're gonna to have to throw your case law in there very, very, very well to support whichever argument you decide to go down. Right. And and I suppose that's, I'll make the final comment that, yeah, I'm, I'm open to arguments on either side. You know, Luke and Talitha, I, I can see where you're coming from. Absolutely. Um, in what what would sort of clinch it one way or the other is more detail in terms of actually getting the exact reasons for decision and actually seeing more content from the migration act right and and for context you know the migration act affords the minister tremendous discretion just in general um but for this scenario we don't that doesn't really matter too much. So from, from an exam perspective, you would get more detail that would help you help clarify one way or the other, uh, or, or make it easier to argue one way or the other. But in general terms, I think we've talked about this in previous weeks. I'm open to um, arguments e in either direction, right? Um, certainly the, the facts, what, what I'm, most interested in is the facts clearly want you to talk about bias um whether you then conclude yes it would be a successful argument or not um that's open uh and and i like the way that i suppose both sides have have presented their arguments um that's really great to see that's really encouraging to see um but what yeah what i would be most concerned with is have you talked about bias? Have you talked about laws? Have you talked about GIA? Uh, sorry, laws and ABT. Legislation you need to talk about too. Uh, but laws and ABT, have you talked about GIA uh, and, and made an argument that makes good use of, of those references rather than, yeah, I'm not too hung up on, do you think that this is absolutely a... a he would win for sure it's definitely biased or um no way in the world is this ever succeeding it's not biased what i'm interested in is the argument the way you use um the material and and the way that you critically analyze um what what arguments you're making right you could you could in your answer say look i think it's i think that there's bias for these reasons but we acknowledge that it would be a weak argument because of these counter counter um, balanced reasons. Something you know, you can you can discuss both sides before reaching a, a tentative conclusion one way or the other. Um, alrighty, that's that's taken us to time. Any very brief last minute questions?
Excellent. So who I said know. who said admin law was boring, Jacob? I oh. love it. <laughs> Excellent. No, I'm I'm really enjoying the 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 discussions and and the way that you guys are um, approaching these tutorial questions. It's really great to see. So well done, everyone, on on your hard work. Um, we'll leave it there. Uh, thanks everyone for coming along. Good luck with your group discussions, uh, and we'll see you next week for our final ground of. Thanks, Jacob. Thank you. Bye. Thank you, Jacob. See you next week.